campus of Wysonic Dandelion College. Wysonic Dandelion College is a free online platform for the purpose of sharing the cutting edge know-how and insights of POC ultrasound applications with global professionals and medical practitioners. Today, we are much honored to invite Dr. Hüdiger Einhaupt and Dr. Wolf and Buchuster from AEN Group in Germany as our webinar speaker to share their valuable experiences of beyond stethoscope and clinic exam, the role of bedside ultrasound in the clinic workup of acute sharpness of breath. Hello, Dr. Einhaus and Dr. Buchuster. Um, Dr. Einhaus, he is a consultant anesthetist and partner of Medical Care Center Medicine, GBR in Stuttgart. And Dr. Ambu Huster, he is the head of the Department of Anesthesiology, Intensive Care, Pin Therapy at Christine Hospital of Wuna. Both of them are world known speaker of ESRA, the European Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pin Therapy. So today's webinar will be divided into two major sessions. The first session is lectured by Dr. Einhaus and Dr. Ambu Huster. The second session is a Q&A part. Welcome all of you to raise your questions and further communicate with our speaker at the whole webinar. Let's welcome Dr. Einhaus and Dr. Ambu Huster. Yes, let's start. Yes, we will. Thank you very much, uh, Jesse. Thanks to the audience. We're pleased uh, to join the webinar, to uh, lead the webinar, and to, to give our experiences to you and discuss our uh, experiences with you. So, uh, as you said, uh, and with your charming dialect, Una. Uh, yeah, is, Una. Is uh, relatively unknown in Germany. Um, I come from the south of Germany, where actually Rüdiger is working. So please, Rüdiger, you're here? Yes, I'm working uh, near Stuttgart, or in Stuttgart, basically, and all around Stuttgart. And so we've got a little uh, private anesthesia practice down there, taking care of roughly 30 different surgery places. And um, so we focus nowadays on the outpatient uh, work and Wolf is more focused on the inpatient care. So, um, and we actually got to know many, many years back and discovered our um, our uh, passion for the ultrasound. And so, this is why we try to develop uh, materials to teach ultrasound. And um, so, today's session is uh, more like a, a didactic session. It's not meant like a scientific approach on like to quote many studies, but we will try to, uh, to explain, to give an introduction into uh, how ultrasound can assist us and help us in doing the workup of uh, patients with acute shortness of breath. And the good thing of the pandemic is that uh, we are having this webinar now. So we're trying to bring uh, all of us a little uh, closer together by this. And we try to contribute in this. Um, the, the less good thing is that we don't see you really and that we can't uh, talk to you directly. So we have no idea who is participating. So maybe we've got many experts uh, under you. Maybe we've got beginners. And so we decided to um, give an overview uh, to have like um, uh, good hints for beginners and to have certainly also some tips and tricks for the experts um, under you. But so mainly, well, how about conflicts of interests? So in our opinion, we do not have uh, conflicts of interest because uh, yes, we're doing courses, yes. We're writing books and yes, uh, we're having uh, public dialogues about ultrasound in lessons for uh, um, some enterprises. But uh, in our opinion, um, we transfer the knowledge and uh, in our opinion, 
this is not a conflict of interest uh, webinar um, give us our question in the q and a section so we don't have to uh, collect them to one time point and hurry through that'd be much better thank you Okay, so uh, what's probably a bit unusual to, um, to some of you is that we are holding this webinar with two speakers. We are actually, uh, we're not sitting uh, on one desk. So, um, so Wolf is in Una, I'm in Stuttgart, and we are trying to um, make little um, interplay with uh, who is talking and who's answering questions. So let's see how we go and we try this method to make the webinar um, kind of entertaining for you and also uh, not so tiring. So um, especially those who are in, in the Far East from our standpoint, they uh, probably, they've had a hard week and it's Friday night now. So we are trying to entertain you that you don't fall asleep. Okay, so let's start. So what will be our session? So we would like to, um, to point out that point of care ultrasound, bedside ultrasound is a very, very good tool to have um, if you have patients with acute shortness of breath who are in respiratory distress. And of course, we still need the clinical examination. We still need the, um, uh, the history, whether the patient is a trauma patient, whether the patient is uh, on an internal ward. So it looks more that, like a cardiac problem or whether the patient comes right uh, from uh, the operating room with maybe an interscaling catheter. So we still need the clinical examination, our clinical view on how to assess patients. We still also may need the stethoscope, but with the stethoscope, our problem was that we tried to hear inside the patient and the noise that gives us information on what we hear is being generated inside the patient. And of course, what we hear is very much dependent on the noises uh, wherever we do the examination. So sometimes we can't hear nothing because we're sitting in a helicopter. So in this case, we prefer to use far more advanced technology like ultrasound that replaces the stethoscope. And now we are putting onto the patient our source of noise from the outside and getting back uh, hopefully wonderful images. So Wolf, what do we see here as an introduction? Well, in our uh, introduction slide, we have uh, different entities. So uh, mainly lung ultrasound was not uh, the primary thing uh, to examine. The stethoscope was first because people uh, and doctors thought that artifacts, artifacts are just bad and not for diagnosing, but uh, for all the other diagnosing procedures we do, this might be true. But lung ultrasound lives from interpretation of the spe specific artifacts. And we go through five different entities like uh, B lines, like actually uh, the diaphragm sign, uh, diaphragm, uh, Everybody's talking about you see the diaphragm, but you don't see the diaphragm, you see the pleura. And uh, in this picture, uh, consolidation. So uh, most of the time, um, we're talking about uh, artifacts that are leading to diagnosis. And uh, this is the most important message. So if we go to the next slide, this is uh, about uh, how uh, people or medical doctors uh, in former times said, oh, you can't diagnose because if you take in a porcine model of lung ultrasound and you do inflation by putting it uh, to a ventilator, you inflate. So all you got, because under the visceral pleura, you just have the intraalveolar air inside that is 100% uh, barrier for ultrasound so all the energy is reflected back and you just have in a multiple line pictures with no possibility uh, to diagnose and that's the reason why in former times doctors said lung ultrasound may not be possible 
And to be more precise, radiologists said this and the medical quite a bit. So if you look at this wonderful picture, you see a surface, a very, very even surface of um, a little lake. And you can see a lot of things on the surface, but you cannot see the ground. So you can see something on the surface, but you can't look through it. And this seems to be a little bit um, the issue with pleural ultrasound that you can look onto the pleural surface, but it's difficult to look inside uh, given that it is a healthy lung. But we can see actually changes on the surface. So imagine on this lake, there's a little uh, wind blowing all over it. Then all of a sudden, it looks like this. So from the perfect mirror image, like here, you get a little bit of, um, of a non-focused or of an alteration of this mirror image. And um, so you see something on the surface that can tell you something about what is underneath but still you cannot see the ground. And this is important in understanding that if we scan a healthy individual, we can't really see something inside the lung, but we can see something on the surface, a lot of mirror images that are being uh, transposed in the lower part under the pleural line in our ultrasound image. So uh, how much of the pleura is actually accessible with ultrasound wolf? Well, uh, one says that about 70% uh, uh, of the pleura uh, might be to be inspected. But in fact, that's for the internal medicine people that have uh, self-griefing patients sitting on the bed because they can put their arms uh, over the head so the scapula rotates. They can uh, use some tools of motion uh, that more of the pleura will be available than for us in the operation theater or the intensive care unit because our patients, they are lying supine, they have cables, they have tapes and drapes. So we think about 50-60% of the pleura would be uh, possible to be inspected by intensivists. So and this might be also possible with uh, the linear probe and also not just for the diaphragm, but also for the pleura with a convex probe. Just uh, let's have a look uh, at this special image. And uh, as I said before, um, when you look uh, through the chest wall, or the, the abdomen from the abdomen to the chest uh, wall, uh, you see the bright light of the diaphragm. That's not diaphragm mus musculature, but that's the impedance signal, hyperechoic of the diaphragm. So this is also part of the pleura we view. And we will come back to the impedance definition in a minute. So um, we will quickly go to some ultrasound basics because for some of you, it might not be so common. So we're talking about certain uh, terms and definitions and we just quickly go over it for the experts. I know you, it's more a matter of how to explain things as you probably do yourself. So um, of course we need the, the B mode, the brightness mode. What is brightness mode, Wolf? Well, the B mode is the two dimensional uh, diagnosing with ultrasound. So uh, you align the probe and you have a kind of diagram with a linear probe. Uh, you uh, have a, a rectangular uh, um, uh, visualization and with the abdominal probe, it is a little bit modified, but it's a 2D image. And the third dimension, that's the movement uh, of your hand that you have a scanning mode that is dynamic over the body. So you, in your own head, the two dimension procedure of ultrasound can be put in a three, three dimensional image in your head. But the B mode is just the scanning picture on the monitor. And basically all the machines start in the brightness mode and it's called brightness because of course, unfortunately, most of our pictures are not colored. So uh, we get different grayscale, so different brightnesses. 
And of course, in order to optimize our ultrasound uh, image, we also can... Uh, well, uh, how quick is the, the sound conduction in air? Because now you visualized how it is in uh, human tissue. It's about 1,540 meters per second. Uh, what about the, the velocity in the air? Well, this is much slower. And the general idea in physics is that the less dense the media is, the slower the sound will travel. So air is not very dense. So the sound is relatively slow with, um, with uh, 330 meters per second. And so the average in human tissue is about five times as fast. And uh, the denser the tissue gets, like in bone, the faster the velocity will be. Like in bone, it's uh, three to 5,000 meters per second. But the ultrasound machines, normally they calculate with an average of uh, the spread of sound of 1,540 meters per second. And so in air, it is much slower. And now imagine you've got um, a bit of sound traveling through the chest wall with the set speed of 1,540 meters per second. And then this sound energy hits the pleura. Behind the pleura, we have air. And the, uh, the velocity is only one fifth of the velocity in the chest wall. So most of the energy is going to be reflected. And um, so this is important to keep in mind when we uh, talk about some artifacts later on. Then there is one more important thing, the acoustic resistance impedance. We will have some slides on that in a minute. And also we need the M mode, the motion mode. We will explain with slides. And at the end, we have a lot of artifacts that are very useful for us for the interpretation of what is below the surface. As we said before, we can't really look inside the lungs given that the lung is healthy. So what is acoustic resistance or impedance wolf? Well, that's not easy um, uh, to explain, but uh, we do it in easy words. So probably medium A is uh, a chest wall, or let's say that's a musculature, and medium B for the first thinking might be fat. So if the sound from the probe reaches the uh, frontier or the barrier from A to B, there's uh, some energy traveling through medium B also, but um, uh, most of the energy is uh, going back to the probe and doing a bright signal on the line that is between medium A, medium B, maybe a fascia. And if you think that medium A is a chest wall and medium B might be uh, the, the pleura, but the, or the intraalveolar air. So there will be no traveling, about no traveling of uh, um, ultrasound energy in medium B. And nearly all energy is just transported back to medium A. So that's a frontier, a barrier, and you don't look at uh, a typically um, um, a pattern of tissue in medium B, but just a reflection mode uh, shows us artifacts as mirror artifacts. We come in later on to that specific topic. So, so but Rüdiger, I have a question uh, to you. So in the, with a B mode, we have a lot of crystals, electric crystals working to generate beam and sound. They are working together um, as apertures. Um, that's B mode. And what about M mode? What is M mode? Well, the motion mode is one specific mode of action of the ultrasound machine that gives one group of crystals a special job. And this one group is called the aperture. So uh, let's say eight different crystals are actually um, uh, connected together electronically. And whereas all the rest are creating the B mode image like here in a hard ultrasound, there is one group that like, for instance, this one here, and this group is activated and the rest of the group is deactivated. 
And all the signals from this particular vertical line is the ECG-like pattern. We get all the motions that are on this particular vertical line. So every white dot that moves will get curvy and every black dot, for instance, that's not gonna move will result in a black line. And uh, now uh, we used to understand AMOD as a very specialized um, uh, working models of the machine that only cardiologists use, but no, it's different now. We also can use it. And what for, Wolf? What do we use the AMOD for? Well, the, the profound uh, the pattern we use uh, AMOD for on the chest wall, we're coming on later on. But also, if you go please to the next picture, we can use it for uh, in acute dyspnea or shortness of breath. Um, mm -hmm. You diagnose also the functioning uh, of the diaphragm because uh, not very seldomly, if you put in an interscaline catheter or you have a trauma patient or you have an internal medicine uh, patient, uh, very, um, very, very sick and shortness of breath, and he has a cancer, so a mediastinal cancer that might uh, affect the vagus nerve um, supplying the diaphragm. And so might be you, you, have, or, or you have to check the function of the uh, diaphragm to assume if it's uh, just musculature, pneumonia, consolidation, or even diaphragm function that leads to a shortening of breath. And that's very easy to diagnose. And here with the M mode through the, um, through the diaphragm or the plural sign of the diaphragm as Rüdiger showed. And if you put it on an ordinate uh, and a system uh, running over the time, you see the movement of the diaphragm going abdominally. You have uh, uh, some peak or on, on top. And if the patient just does a short sniff, so a, a very short inspiration, it is better shown most of the times in a picture than uh, a, a, a weak normal breath. So you can image it really perfectly and uh, you save the picture and you can assure that the diaphragm is not the reason for the shortness of breath in the patient. And what you so, see here, for instance, is uh, when the patient breathes in deeply, um, for those of you who know it already, there is what we call the lung is actually merging underneath the probe. And this is why you get an image artifact here, which is called the dirty curtain, because you don't see anything anymore. And this is actually what we want. So uh, we want the, the lung to be filled with air and uh, with inspiration, it will actually move underneath the probe, so you've got the dirty curtain. And if you image this in M mode, you see it like this looks like little mountains, and this looks like more uh, like a volcano erupting. And this is the dirty curtain coming into the image. And uh, whenever we see the dirty curtain coming in, we know that there uh, cannot be a large amount of effusion into the pleural cavity. So the dirty curtain is our friend. Okay, so if we have a patient um, like after uh, surgery, after shoulder surgery in recovery room and the saturation drops and it is not um, too much um, opioids remaining, if it's not too much um, uh, muscle relaxant remaining, uh, we may have a look on the diaphragm. And if you see the B mode image, the patient is asked to do very deep inspirations. But the only thing that happens is that there is, it's like a wobbly picture of the diaphragm here. And this results in a rather flat line in the M mode. So this is a proof of diaphragmatic hemiparesis after interscaling uh, block with catheter. And so what do you do? Of course, in this uh, lady here, we, um, we didn't even start the catheter. So we just stopped it and uh, waited until the diaphragm was um, uh, back to normal. And then we um, only used the catheter, uh, well, if you can't deal with the pain uh, in any other way. But she is, of course, on the normal ward, she is, um, she is in jeopardy of getting shortness of breath un 
uh, unmonitored. So, um, of course, it's only a question of a few minutes to look on the diaphragm and then you know uh, what is the so, Usually, we do have uh, a supine lying patient and uh, most uh, or many times we're looking for pneumothoraxes um, and the air that should be detected outside of the lung will be at the region just uh, 10 centimeters per sternal. And so the most important window is the direct parasternal window to both sides. So if you look at the chest wall right here, you have the, the subcutaneous fat tissue, you have the pectoralis muscle and the, uh, um, uh, the uh, now give me a help, Rüdiger, the... Um, the intercostal muscles and the, the ribs. Intercostal, yeah, yeah. The intercostal muscle, uh, you, you can say it's the external intercostal and the internal intercostal. And uh, below, you have uh, the thoracal fascia and the, um, the pleura parietalis that are fixed on each other end to the tissues. So, and these uh, pleura parietalis is doing the perfect error, error, no, mirror image, error managed because it's artifacts, the mirror image of the chest wall below the picture. We come so let's have a look what we see. So yeah. um, you might have heard from a term that is called the A-lines. And A-lines are just artifacts that um, develop as mirror artifacts. So you see the skin with S and the P like the pleura. The pleura is the brightest uh, section in this image because this is um, the mirror plane where most of the energy gets reflected right away by hitting it only one time. So um, the sound travels through the pleura with 1540 meters per second, uh, hits it and gets reflected. And um, on the way back to the probe, there is another change of impedance between the skin and the probe itself. So some of the energy doesn't get into the probe right away, but it's being reflected back to the pleura and then goes back to the probe. And this results in a doubled um, travel time of the sound. So the sound travels from the probe to the pleura, back to the probe. And once it gets into the probe, it will actually result in an image like the pleura. But the parts of the sound that are being reflected here, they travel back to the pleura again. So the travel time is doubled and the machine thinks, oh, okay, the reflector must be deeper. So you get another line here. And so the definition of A lines is a mirror image where the skin to pleura distance is um, being depicted inside the lung. And of course, this is not real. This is just artifact. And you also can have this with a curve pro. You see it here, the pleura is here, the real pleura ribs are here. And now we've got one A line here, another one here, and we can hence have several A lines being um, depicted. And our opinion is it is important to know that also in literature we have A lines, but for us it's not so important for a diagnostic um, process. So, of course, if we see A lines, um, it doesn't say too much to us. But of course, A lines would not be present here in case we've got a big effusion. So, what else do we have on artifacts, Wolf? Well, the most important artifacts are the comet tail artifacts. They were primarily uh, shown by uh, Daniel Lichtenstein from Paris. Uh, that is many years ago, uh, ago already. So how are they being created? So the, as, I, as I mentioned already before, the, the parietal pleura is just stick to the chest wall. The um, visceral pleura is adhesive on uh, the lung surface. And you got probably um, not a straight line or a straight plain tissue, but you have some septors like interlobular septor, where the typical motion fluid between the two pleura um, uh, fascias uh, can be uh, can collect. 
And uh, in interlobular uh, uh, septula, there are also some lymphatic wet drop of fluid works like an acoustic lens. So all the energy is uh, um, re reflected like uh, um, uh, directly and in a reverberation mode that the sound that's going um, back to the probe and detected by the probe shows some kind of artifact picture until the energy, until the reverberation energy is gone for the scanning moment. So it starts with a bright line. And uh, as you see in the picture here, it's not just a straight line downwards, but you mention from one point of the visceral pleura, you have about three lines in a different angle. And this is because uh, ultrasound beam is not just straight running through, but in every action of um, the piezo crystals or the apertures that are working together, you have a straight beam down and also an angulated one to 10, 20 or 30 degrees to both sides. And that's the compound imaging or cross beam as well as, or as different manufacturers say. And this is indicating, so every, every comet tail artifact that can be imagined on a picture that is moving with inspiration up and down or even also with the, the systole or diastolic movement of the heart and the thorax, says that no pneumothorax is possible in this position to the actual moment. Okay, thank you. Let's go on to, um, to beelines. Beelines are the big brothers of the cometate artifact because they result in just bigger amount of um, fluid collections in the pleural space. So um, as Wolf uh, explained, the, the sound energy is trapped inside uh, fluid collections and uh, goes back and forth so many times that the uh, sound travel time is being longer. And this is why the ultrasound machine thinks, okay, again, the reflector must be deeper. And you can get this, uh, of course, with linear probes like here or with um, curved arrays like here, and the amount of beelines we see, and beelines actually they go over the whole ultrasound image, and uh, the amount of beelines um, somewhat um, is um, a sign for the fluid in the lungs. So congestive heart failure, very often um, you will see an increase in the amount of beelines. And um, oh. as we said before, this can be one um, one reason for acute shortness of breath. Well, so a qu question from me to you, Rüdiger. So beelines, very often, if you have more than three beelines, uh, people or doctors say, oh, that's a cardiac edema. So there might be other reasons uh, for beelines than cardiac edema, don't, don't we? Uh, yes, of course, they are. Uh, going back to the physics, we get uh, beelines whenever there is enough fluid collections. and. Uh, and this fluid collection is only a small amount of fluid collection. So it's not like in pleural effusion. Um, and of course you can have other pulmonary diseases like also in, um, in consolidation when there is an infiltrate inside the tissue, you can have fluid collection. And of yes, course yes. bee lines are possible, but those bee lines may not start from the pleural line. This is a little bit of a difference. And in the consensus conferences, people are actually arguing that uh, um, ordinary bee lines should be a beginning at the plural line, but there is some discussion on this. Yes, okay. the multiple, multiple bee lines should not be just at one point. It should be over both lungs. That's important. Uh, that might be, uh, they might appear in lung contusion, in acute pneumonia at the actual uh, part of the lung where it uh, arises, are in pleuritis and in many rheumatic diseases. That's to be known. So, so what about um, what about diagnosing with a with a curved probe, Rüdiger? Yeah, same thing. So so the curved probe has the advantage that we have a sort of wide angle view. So um, as here you see the rip shadows, 
of um, uh, two to three reps, and then you can actually assess several intercostal space at once and um, use the zoom window in the chest wall, like here. And then you enlarge the picture. You have a very, very quiet picture. So every gray dot remains a gray dot, every white dot likewise. But if you now set the, um, the zoom um, area below the plural line, you've got a very, very unsteady image. So it is what you can call a flickering image. So every gray and black dots changes in the gray scale. And this is very typical for um, coming back to the photographs of the lake we had in the beginning. So, so when you look at the chest wall, it's a very, very um, calm picture, like the surface on the first photograph. But if you're now coming underneath the pleura, this is what happens underneath, secondary to the sliding of the lungs. So both um, sheath of the pleura are um, uh, moving against each other, and then you've got the little fluid collections um, between, and this results in this flickering image below the pleura. And whenever you see this, there can't be a pneumothorax, right? So, and if we look at this on the M mode, the M mode, as we explained before, um, so we have one aperture um, going, uh, being activated. And now we've got like, um, oh, sorry, it's B mode. So we've got like, <laughs> sorry, uh, we've got one comet tail artifact now. And you see that this is exactly the, the heart rate. So this is called the lung pulse. And the lung pulse normally only is visible um, inside the lung until the pleura. So it is not visible inside the chest wall. So when you put a um, color power Doppler on it, you only see it underneath the pleura and not in the chest wall. And likewise, if you put a, a, the M out in it, you only can see this pulsating uh, thing underneath the pleura. The pleural line is the brightest line here. And you see um, parallel lines here as being the chest wall. And you see the sandy image here, but you see some columns here. Do you see this? And this is part of the heartbeat, the uh, differences in the pressure generated by the heart is being uh, transmitted to the chest wall, but only to the border of the pleura. Right. So this is the lung pulse. And again, this transmission of the pressure changes of the heart only can happen when there is no pneumothorax. So whenever you see lung pulse, can't be a pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is ruled out, ruled out then. Oh, let's come again to all the artifacts again and uh, let's resume a little bit. So in normal respiratory function of the pleura, if you align the probe and in the B mode picture, you see mirror artifact, the mirror line is the pleural line. The mirror line, the actual mirror line is the parietal pleura. The visceral pleura that slides does the flickering of the mirror image. Just imagine this for a mode. Then you look for lung sliding. Look for little hyperechoic points that are running up and down with inspiration and expiratory function of the lung. If you don't see it in the uh, normal picture, parasternal between the ribs, just look under the cartilaginous ribs because you can look through. They have a lot amount of, uh, of water, the cartilage of the ribs, and it also works like about uh, a lens. And under it, you can really see the um, pleural line with a sliding movement and sometimes much better than in the free field between the ribs. So you look again for the artifact of the A line, but that's not a very, very good, uh, valuable diagnosing parameter. A line, one says, is if the A lines are erased by B lines, 
you, you see no A lines because the B lines are prominent. You have to think about a cardiac edema or uh, some disease that, that produce the B lines. Situation like after a deceleration a trauma and uh, the, a lung trauma or in a pleuritis, in a regional pleuritis or in a regional pneumonia. There may be the appearance of B lines too, just regionally. If the patient does not ventilate, so he just stops, but has heart function, you see the lung pulse that Rüdiger showed you in the last slide. Uh, just uh, say uh, to the patient, hold your breath, and you see the little hyperechoic points or the comet tail artifacts just going with uh, the function of systole and diastole of the heart. So that's the motion artifact. And you also can motion, you can visualize motion in ultrasound in a color Doppler in color Doppler. And we come in again to that issue later on. So the emote, let's go to emote again. Uh, please go to, yes, uh, to the next information point. The emote leads to a picture that uh, actually we can say when, where you have the barcode sign of the chest wall in the MO picture, that's kind of stratosphere. So that's uh, the sky picture. If you have the plural as the mirror line and underneath with a working um, visceral pleura not having a pneumothorax, the bright mirror image is disturbed by a sandy pictures because of the flickering and the flickering in the M mode, whereas Rüdiger says, does uh, statically or permanently changing of the gray values. So uh, that's not just a, a, a dot, a dark dot stays a dark dot, a white dot stays as a white dot. And this is, this is creating the sandy picture underneath the plura, and we say in the, in the liter literature or uh, actually uh, under doctors very prominently, you hear the seashore sign for that appearance. And seashore sign is a normal finding. So just to repeat it quickly, we have the chest wall window and the amount is in there like this. You see the lung sliding and now you put it in M mode and you see the sand, you see um, the wall, and you see the sky. And this is the seashore sign and you might keep it in mind much better if you remember this. So <laughs> this is part of the idea um, the ones had when they discovered it. Okay, so this is normal finding. Seashore sign is Good. So what else do we have? Let's go to a clinical case. So we have a patient and um, uh, we have an MO picture and um, he has been intubated and the saturation drops. So what is it? Is the FiO2 too low? Is, um, what is the problem? And let's see, let's say you were um, in an aircraft doing patient retrievals or in a helicopter. So you can't use your stethoscope. Of course, normally you would just um, listen onto the chest. In this case, you just put your probe on and what you see on the right side is basically a seashore sign. So as we said before, this is normal finding. So that's normal. So if you go on the other side, what you see here is again, seashore sign in a way, but it is also with lung pulse. So uh, two normal findings. So what's wrong with it? The saturation still drops. So uh, taking into consideration um, like the idea on how lung pulse comes about, it must be that there is no lung sliding because the pressure changes of the heart are being transmitted to the pleura, creating the lung pulse. So there is no lung sliding. Hence, this patient is intubated too deeply. So the left side is not ventilated. There is no pneumothorax, but it's not ventilated. So tube out and the problem is solved. Okay, so let's talk about pneumothorax. So 
um, the artifacts are somewhat different now because the mirror artifact is um, in B mode. Uh, it is not this unsteady flickering image anymore underneath the plural line. So uh, there is a perfect mirror artifact, mirror image of the chest wall below the surface of the plural, below the, um, um, the mirror plane. So no lung sliding, you have no comma tails or B lines because there are no fluid collections as such as they could create B lines. And um, in the M mode, you have got this perfect mirror image also underneath the pleura. So we are getting to the barcode or stratosphere sign. And again, put in other images, we've got this um, M mode image here as normal um, seashore sign. And if you look at the two B mod images here, you've got on one side, you see like the normal uh, lung sliding and on the other side, you don't see it. So it is not there. Lung sliding is missing. And if you go into M mode, you see this. So you have seashore sign on the one side and stratosphere sign on the, on the, on the other. So the sand is missing because the disturbance of the lung sliding is missing. So this is what you get. And so whenever you find this, you may have pneumothorax. So it is like a barcode, like a stratosphere all over the MOD image, like this. Okay, so Wolf, why do we wanna use more ultrasound in patients with acute shortness of breath and uh, pneumothorax? Well, the answer is because it has a much, much, much better sensitivity. So let's look at, at this very old study. Um, they had in a trauma center about 135 patients having all the diagnostic you'd like to have, uh, to have a complete diagnostic, but one uh, thought that is a complete diagnostic. So you always do the x-ray. Uh, most of the times you do in, uh, by, by a harmfully uh, trauma patient, a chest uh, CT, uh, everyone had uh, a lung ultrasound. And if you look um, in the next uh, information points uh, for the sensitivity, when you do in a chest, a parasternal, as we showed you, a parasternal ultrasound of both lungs in 68% uh, sensitivity. So you find the diagnosis of pneumothorax in, in the patient um, is much, much higher than in the radiologic uh, procedure of a di two-dimensional picture because all the partial pneumothoraxes, as you see in that CT scan here, um, are not uh, leading to a diagnosis to a par partial Thorax because in a two-dimensional conventional radiolog radiologic picture, the lung may be completely over the hemithorax and you miss the diagnosis of a, a pathology. And that's about a 50% better sensitivity. So you're the better doctor, you have better diagnosis or probably quicker therapies. So let's look at the next picture. So please, the next slide. Uh, one may ask, well, with ultrasound, you are really, really good diagnoser. But Rudiger, what about uh, the diagnosing of the size of the pneumothorax? Yeah, that's actually um, an issue because if you've got only like a very, very small partial pneumothorax with a little, um, a bit of air collection between the, the two plural sheets, the acoustic phenomenon is the same as if it was a big pneumothorax. So um, looking at the M mode, you get the barcode sign or the stratosphere sign right away. If it's only like one millimeter of air collection between the two sheets. So it is the same image like having 10 centimeters uh, because uh, there is no lung sliding. And so with only just one, a scanning window, you can't tell anything about the size of the pneumothorax. And uh, because of this, you need to get to bring your probe 
in motion. So you have to slide it more laterally uh, in the same intercostal uh, space, for instance. And then all over a sudden, you may find that you get a normal finding like here. So you slide the probe from peristernal position more laterally. You have numerous, um, the lung will actually um, uh, get uh, in contact to the chest wall. And with expiration, it will lose the contact. And um, so by this, you can actually say something about the size of the pneumothorax and this um, changing of normal finding and uh, pathologic finding is uh, named the lung point. And of course you can see it also in the ML. So this is normal seashore sign. This is full pneumothorax. And with inspiration, you may find this. So it changes from pneumothorax to seashore sign. And this is the lung point which has the highest specificity in diagnosing pneumothorax. And now let's go to, to a clinical case. So someone comes in with shortness of breath and you just uh, look on the, um, on the B mode images and you see on this side here that there is some normal lung sliding here. You see the unsteady image, email image um, here. And, ich wollte das and on that side, you see that there is a lot of motion. But if you look on the plural line, there is no lung sliding, like it is here. And if you look at this on the M mode, you will find a normal seashore sign here. That's normal on the right body side. So no pneumothorax there. But here you find the, um, the barcode sign, the stress of your sign. So there is some pneumothorax here. And Wolf, why does this area kind of looks like lung power? So there is some sort of column going through the whole chest wall. Could this be lung power? And could it, could it be um, a pneumothorax ruled out in shortness of breath of other reasons? That's a very, very, very good question, because you have to look profoundly at the picture. If you look profoundly, you see underneath the pleura, really the sign like the start of the motion of the heart and a systole and a diastole with a, the two lines going uh, completely through. But um, if you look at the chest wall, um, you see the both lines also going through the chest wall. And that means that if you do have a patient with a dyspnea and with a dyspnea who is fighting for oxygenation, he's uh, using his additional musculature of the thorax wall to inspirate and to expirate heavily. And this does also for if you have a pneumothorax on this side, really. And he uses the other side of the lung for extreme motion of the chest wall. You have an, a pneumothorax picture on this side with continuing lines in the chest wall indicating that he is in heavily dyspnea. But if you look at the uh, moving picture, you see that there's originally no movement of the lung in B mode. In M mode, you have no sandy space and the lines are completely going through underneath and over the pleural line through the chest wall. And that's just the visualization of the muscular picture of dyspnea breathing of the patient. Okay, so, so we have to keep in mind that lung pounds only and normal conditions goes to the pleural line and not into the chest wall, unless with like septic patients. Sometimes you can see the pulsations on ICU just from looking from the outside, but this is an exception. So normally the lung pound stops on the pleural line. And if you scan yourself, you may try this out. You can just um, use the normal scanning window peristernal. And if you then put the M out in and you do some cuffing exercises, you will see that there are um, motion artifacts through the whole chest wall. So this is not lung pounds, of course, this is just cuffing and motion of the chest wall. Okay, so um, let's try to have a quick look on another 
case and then looking uh, on the timeline with a few more minutes before we actually uh, can start the Q&A um, part and um, please if you haven't done already collect your questions and uh, write them into the Q&A uh, section of this meeting so that we can later on um, come into a nice discussion. Well the patient clinically he's a young healthy individual um, like under rest, he wouldn't actually have uh, um, shortness of breath. So there is a fracture, there is nothing on the chest x-ray. And so how about ultrasound? So we've got the right body side here, the left body side here. And so we look onto um, the b mount image and we see normal lung sliding here. And on the other side, we don't see it. We see some motion from inspiration and expiration. So the plural is uh, the plural is kind of being bulged outside and inside by the um, chest pressure changes, but there is no lung sliding. So looks like pneumothorax. So we put M out in, and M out is a bit of um, a difficult thing because um, the quality of the image depends very much on the insonation angle. So uh, here you can see sort of um, a seashore sign. And here you can see sort of a barcode sign. However, it's not good image quality. So you have to work with your probe to get it um, visualized much better like here. So now you've got a very clear sandy picture, uh, normal finding on the left body side and uh, pneumothorax on the right body side. And of course we can also use uh, the other modes of the machine to visualize it like the power Doppler, or you can even use the normal Doppler and adjust the flow velocity to very low flows and you get basically the same. So we've got lung panels in color power Doppler below the plural line. And uh, if we do the same thing, same machine settings on the other side, nothing happens. So there must be pneumothorax. So no transmission of the pressure changes through the lung, through the two plural sheath to the plural line. So now what you see here, and this might be difficult to see, um, maybe the, uh, the transmission of a zoom is not so good, but sometimes you see normal lung sliding. Sometimes like now you don't see it. And now all of a sudden it comes back. So this is in B mode image. This is lung point. And this is, um, as you can see here, you see a rip here and you also can see the pleura underneath the rib. This means this is cartilage. So this must be um, in very, very uh, near vicinity to the sternum. So it's, um, uh, and you can see the lung point in this position. So this pneumothorax is only a very small one. And if you look at this in M mode, you see the typical lung point here. And if you then, go all like here. It's just um, a different uh, position. And so if you look at the chest CT scan then, you see that there is a minor pneumothorax here and um, which was not seen on the X-ray. But you see it with ultrasound. You are much quicker with ultrasound because you have a bad side, you just put the probe on and you can have the diagnosis. The CT scan takes a while the X-ray takes a while because you need to get the order in. You need to come the radiology assistance um, with the machine to the bed, unless you are in emergency room anywhere, uh, anywhere where you have it available. But then it takes more time. And with ultrasound, you can get the diagnosis right away. But Wolf, if you have this diagnosis, let's say you are in emergency room, you put your probe on and in two minutes you have got the diagnosis. Okay, it's a trauma patient. He has pneumothorax on one side and it's not very big because you've found the lung point right here. Okay, because if it was a big pneumothorax, you can't find the lung point because at uh, no position, there is a normal finding. Okay, back into this case, you are in the emergency room, you find pneumothorax sign. Do you then do a chest x-ray? What is your clinical procedure? Do you then do another exam like one hour later? What do you do? So that's a very, very good question. And uh, we, uh, in our experience, uh, 
uh, with the patients that had abdominal operation and uh, having uh, uh, esophageal um, surgery. And uh, so you have air, um, so you produced by an abdominal operation uh, near the diaphragm, a pneumothorax on one side. We usually, after, uh, before closing, expand it. And if you look afterwards to a new appearance, clinically reshaping patient uh, in the emergency room, um, you diagnose in about 90% a small pneumothorax. So what you have collect is the data of the patient. If he has just no oxygen or two liters of oxygen and the saturation is about 100% and the appearance of the pneumothorax with a long point is just in three centimeters uh, laterally from parasternal positioning. So that's not harmful. You don't really know the distension from anterior to posteriorly, but you have to assume it by clinical thinking. If this might be a big pneumothorax or a small pneumothorax and the ability and the clinical appearance of the patient, how he talks, how he speaks um, and how the saturation behaves with and without uh, uh, additional oxygen le leads us to a diagnosis together with uh, an ultrasound we're doing uh, about two hours later to just look if it is more expanded or lower expanded, just, just stay stationary with a good clinical picture, then we don't do an x-ray anymore. Okay. Bit, bit, okay. We, in which patients do we have a limit in diagnosing vertigo? That's uh, a really good slide. question because we have got, we've got a very good method, but we also have to know the limitations of this method. And so to know the pitfalls and look at this CT scan here, you've got a, um, well, medium-sized pneumothorax, but you also, secondary to the trauma, you've got an emphysema of the chest wall. And if you put a probe onto this position right now, the sound can travel to the pleural line. So quite obviously, you only can uh, diagnose the pneumothorax or rule it out when the sound gets to the pleura. If not, there is no point diagnosing. But the ultrasound image would look kind of the same because you've got the same reflection from the chest wall conduction velocity of, of sound, 1540, to air in the emphysema of the chest wall. So it would kind of look like pneumothorax, but you have no window. So this is uh, the reason why uh, the sensitivity, uh, sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound is not 100% because we still have cases. Uh, we need all the other methods of um, imaging. So uh, in doubt, of course, you go for what you're used to do. And of course, a trauma patient gets a CT scan anyway. That's normal. Um, but keep in mind that the, um, the method has some limitations like this one here. Okay, so um, you may have in your facility or in your country, you may have checklists when to, uh, how to use ultrasound or what to do if you want to rule out um, pneumothorax after central venous line, for instance. And uh, we are used to doing chest x-rays and uh, to rule out pneumothorax after a subclavian line, for instance. But of course, uh, if it's only a small one, there is no point doing a chest x-ray unless you want to also control the position of the catheter. So um, like as a practical idea, it is enough after the procedure to rule out pneumothorax by ultrasound. And of course, in case of clinical deterioration, you would scan again. And if you then detect a pneumothorax, you look for lung point in order to get an idea on how large it is but then you for sure also need X-ray to see whether it is really a big one. And uh, together with the clinical picture, you decide whether or not to put a drain in or not, or just wait and do controls. And so we have checklists also for um, how to use it in the workup of um, shortness of breath, 
this is not for you to, to read fully right now. Uh, we have got it in one of the books uh, we wrote. And of course, this is available um, on our, um, in our web shop. But unfortunately, this has been translated only into English and Polish. So it is not available um, in China yet. So you may have your own checklist in your facilities. So Wolf, what is... Let's come to the patients to uh, probably uh, uh, the intensive care unit. So uh, think of a patient that is having a pneumonia and you don't distinguish uh, a speci specific bacteria or virus for the pneumonic uh, disease. And you have just a small amount of effusion. And you, with that, uh, after, if you own, ha only have blood culturing that, are, that is negative, and you have a small pleural effusion with ultrasound, you have really an easy and very safe way to do an intervention and to drain the fluid. And we're going to the next picture. What you have to do, if you uh, go with the abdominal probe, you start with 15 centimeters of depth. So if you want to do a uh, uh, an intervention, you have to reduce the depth to about five centimeters, or you can use the linear probe. So if you use the linear probe, you can straight go just centimeters or millimeters above the diaphragm. And even if you have the appearance of a compression atelectasis, you can put in the needle safely and look how close the needle and the catheter is actually kissing the diaphragm. And it's a safe procedure where you can get a good uh, diagnosing tool of microbiologic uh, specificity of uh, pneumonic uh, diagnosis that you don't get in blood culturing or with a sputum uh, or tracheal secrets that are negatively for one or two weeks in a very, very uh, harmful pneumonia with RDS. So you're doing safe procedures. And what we do promote is not just like it is mostly done. That's what people say in our workshops. In the workshops, they say, oh, they mostly do a scan. They look uh, at the chest wall where the best collection of fluid is. They put away the probe and they insert blindly in the needle. But we had, uh, nevertheless, we had uh, pneumothoraxes uh, appearing from uh, evacuating pleural fluids. And this is not necessary. You can do safe procedures. The needles are smaller. You have Seldinger set. And you can even use uh, needles uh, with another surface that is uh, ultrasound friendly, that they can visualize the needle better than an image you saw before. Uh, with a tool of many ultrasound manufacturers, you see a diagonal line in the picture. Uh, on the right side uh, of that line, you're visualizing the drain easily. And on the left side, it is, it is about invisible. And that's a, a, for, uh, that's a technical issue with the piezo crystals or the apertures. As we said before, we've done some physical information. They don't just uh, send uh, the beam um, uh, directly, but can also in every uh, impulse send directly and 10 or 20 and 30 degrees to one and to other side to have an optimization of the picture. And if you say to the probe, um, do mostly uh, put the beam in, a, in lines to the right uh, uh, down side where you have an angle of 90 degrees between ultrasound beam and the needle or here in the picture the catheter and on the right side where you have all the lines going obliquely you have a good visualization of the drain and on the left side with just uh, a straight beam going through you have S uh, in the needle with a steer angle, uh, very, very bad imaging of interventional materials. Thank you. So, so that was quite in depth, Wolf. I doubt that everyone would be able to recall this all in detail. So um, looking at our timeline, I think um, it will be good to 
um, to uh, summarize what the take home mes uh, messages are. So we have an ultrasound method, bedside point of care ultrasound with some standard scanning windows, some standard uh, machine working uh, modules like M mode and B mode and the color models. And we have patients with pneumothorax, we can diagnose with diseases uh, like um, in consolidation, where we can see something in the lung where we shouldn't be able to see something because uh, normally there is only air, but in this case, there is blood or whatever. And then all of a sudden, we can see something uh, which shouldn't be there under normal conditions. So we're very happy to now go over to the Q&A. Um, so I, I looked at the questions and probably I can summarize. We have uh, two questions appearing. And uh, the first, uh, Marco, he said, uh, well, in cases of uh, coronary pneumonia or a beeline picture with pneumonia and critical illness, um, you have uh, lung injury and problems. And the question is, um, in patients with a coronary pneumonia, can anticholinergic drugs play a role in improving lung injury and corrupting hypoxia? And my first answer is, in my opinion, no, because this is drying out uh, the lung. And drying out the lung, you mostly have more problems with the secrets coming out of the lung. Um, we are using anticholinergic drugs very seldomly. And I tell you in what cases. Well, if you have a case having a patient with an apoplex situation, or I remember a young girl with 14 years, multiply um, cerebral um, diseases uh, that is very, very uh, impaired and lying 24 hours in bed, uh, nearly and harmfully injured with the pneumonia one or two times a year, um, going to intubation and extubation and extubating patients that have problems with the swallowing act uh, and they have a hypersecretion and you want to avoid reintubation. We use an anticholinergic drugs together with site positioning of the patient or in the uh, case of the girl, we uh, had about uh, nearly lying prone position and extubating with the help of anticholinergic drugs. That was a way to really be helpful with uh, the, uh, this medication that usually in pneumonia, we don't use anticholinergic drugs to improve a lung injury picture or correcting hypoxia. What do you think, Rudiger? Well, um, I'm just having trouble to get like the key point of of what we just said. So to <laughs> that was no to, ultrasound question. Yeah, that yeah. Well, that was a clinical question. Um, so they just so testing, I, no, they, they are just testing us. Are they just ultrasonographers <laughs> that are clinically bad? So we have yeah, to. Yeah. Well, that. well, there is an issue whether we also are intensivists, <laughs> right? And I can say from my side, look, I'm focusing on outpatient cases, so you <laughs> care with the ICU patients. And the second question is again something. Uh, uh, that is related to the uh, pandemic at the moment. So uh, someone is asking like that we have severe uh, pneumonia and serious complications with acute respiratory distress syndrome. And um, the question is for patients undergoing a new coronary pneumonia surgery, what interventions are available in perioperative management to promote the treatment of such patients. So this is a very wide question that goes... Shall I answer? Uh, oh, please don't. <laughs> uh, that goes um, um, kind of far beyond like the ultrasound issue we have. So it's more like on how um, the, the, the treatment is in general in uh, ARDS. And um, so our idea is, first of all, to use a method on how to diagnose to collect all the phenomena you get with patients. So we would like to encourage you to use the ultrasound even on COVID patients 
uh, um, in an isolation room. So you kind of wrap the ultrasound machine so that it's hygienically clean. Like in Europe, the treatment procedure uh, nowadays is that we um, we refrain from having chest x-rays every day in the severe ICU patients because it has no consequence. We refrain on uh, doing um, chest CT scans every so often because no consequence. So we use um, the much less invasive diagnostic procedure of ultrasound. We just put the probe on and, um, and then we do not have to transport the patient. So that's actually quite good. And then you have got the clinical course and then you go with the protocol, your facility, your country have to deal with severely sick patients. So, so there, was there was raised another question, a, a third question. The question is, can you go over to scan the diaphragm, especially the left side? So if we go back to picture, so which picture? Where do we have a scan of the well, diaphragm um, scanning? No surface. Though. I'll... I'll, uh, I'll try and get it. Um, well, um, you, you're looking for the picture and I probably start uh, to say some words. Well, if, how to scan the diaphragm? So um, you, use the, you use position of the fast scanning. So the trauma scanning you do. You have to use the abdominal or the curved probe. You align the probe to the chest wall. And uh, mostly important is if uh, we uh, go with a probe, we on the right side look through the window of a parenchymatic organ, and that's the liver. We're going easily through the liver because we, we align the probe somewhere, <laughs> and you look through the, uh, the liver, you look under the diaphragm for some fluid and you reach uh, even also um, uh, other organs but on the left side as you ask you just you always go with a long longitudinal scanning on the right side very easily you scan uh, the positioning where you assume that you have uh, the, the sectioning of the, the thorax and the abdomen, uh, respectively the liver. And if you find the liver, you put the probe obliquely with uh, the cranial point of the, um, of the probe going about 30 degrees uh, rotated in the intracostal space that you don't have any um, blocking of yeah. the bones. Rudiger, you want to say something? Well, the, the, advantage, yes, the advantage of the webinar is that we can discuss it with uh, someone uh, who's very far away. The disadvantage is that we can't just present it like in normal ultrasound courses and just do an exercise. So in an exercise, it would be quite easy to answer this question and how to hold the probe and how to focus on the diaphragm to get a good result that you can actually use for your diagnosis. And of course, it's more difficult on the left side because the spleen is smaller, because you sometimes have, um, have air in the stomach, for instance, especially in ICU patients uh, with gastric reflux, for instance. So um, um, it is difficult to get the right scanning window, but still it's possible. And then you just scan the diaphragm, use your methods of, uh, is there a dirty curtain? Or do you get an MO? Do you get like the regular uh, pattern of a diaphragmatic? Uh, movement, even um, in ventilated patient, you can make use of it because in a mechanically ventilated patient, of course, you have no diaphragmatic innovation, but you can still see a dirty curtain. The problem is that having a, a peep of whatever eight to ten, then the uh, diaphragmatic cupula is very flat and the scanning window gets very, very small. But whenever you have got a spontaneously breathing patient on the machine, you get diaphragmatic innovation, and then it's much easier to see. So do we have any other questions, Wolf? No. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Anhap and Dr. Ambuster, and uh, presentation and helped us many questions in detail professionally. Thank you. And um, uh, meanwhile, thanks all audience for joining us. For more information, please subscribe and follow my Sonic official account on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or other medias to turn with us. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. And uh, stay healthy. All the best to everyone. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure to be with you.